So it is my my honor and pleasure to introduce Professor Wen Mei Hu from the uh, University of Illinois. He is the AFD Sanders Chair Professor at Illinois, one of the biggest endowed chairs in electrical engineering at Illinois. Illinois, as you know, as you may know, is one of the top uh, electrical engineering programs in the U.S. Uh, when May got his PhD, he got, well, he, when May got his bachelor's degree at Taida in uh, Taipei, and then his PhD at the University of California at Berkeley, and then he moved to Illinois as an assistant professor, and uh, associate professor, professor, I never liked the word full professor. Full professor, I think, is a professor who's just finished eating, you know, <laughs> so I don't really like that term. And now an endowed chair. Uh, what is most important about Wenmei, as far as you're concerned, uh, and the reason why you should be paying attention to him, is that he always seems to have the right vision for what one should work on next. You'll notice the title, Rethinking Computer Architecture. So he's been rethinking every step of the way very successfully. He did his PhD at Berkeley in microarchitecture. He was a critical member of the team that came up with uh, out-of-order execution, in-order retirement, uh, wide issue, dynamic scheduling. Um, and uh, when he got his PhD, instead of like most PhDs and then milking that cow for the rest of his life, he immediately looked and said, you know, what's really important is what the compiler can provide. And so he did a complete reset. The next couple of years published practically nothing. Everybody told him he's never going to get tenure at this rate. And ended up producing computer, uh, compiler technology, the impact compiler, for example, uh, which beat the pants off of all the industrial compilers. And he did that for the next 10 years or so. And then he went and then took another step back and said, you know, what we really need to do is look at this what the GPU can provide for non-graphics processing. And he's been enormously successful over the last several years doing that. And I'm looking forward to hearing what he plans for the next period of his career. Professor Hu. Thank you, Yeah. So uh, just for those of you who wonder, uh, in about a month will be the 30th anniversary that I met Yale. So that tells you how old he is, and it also tells you how old I am now. So uh, we're now counting decades, so it's a kind of a very much an honor to be in the same age category as you now, yeah. Uh, but I was, I was really honored to, to be asked to, to give this talk, because uh, I know this is one of the hardest talks that uh, I'll ever give. You know, what people in this room is has an incredible collection of knowledge in terms of different types of discipline related to computer architecture. And um, I consider this one to be a tougher audience than most of the other uh, conferences that I have been given talk at. So I thought about the long and hard. And I, you know, I went to my, my, uh, my neighborhood, and this is about a quarter mile away from my house. Right? So this is what I see every day when I drive to work. And so I thought about it, I said, okay, these are, you know, wide vectors and, you know what, uh, GPU lanes, and so I'm going to give a good technical talk on how to use these things. Things change when people come to Samos. So, during the weekend, I was in uh, Pedagogia, and, um, you know, this is the view out of the balcony of the hotel, and then I was looking at it, and I said, okay, maybe I will change the talk the title to A Few Thoughts on Computer Architecture While in Samos. I think this is hopefully a good dialogue. And um, you know, if you are interested in any of the topics, please just raise your hand and you know, we should discuss. This is really meant to be a conversation rather than a kind of a one-way uh, information transfer. So a few things I'd like to touch. One is where are we today in computer architecture? And second one is computer architecture's interface between software and hardware. And a few things that have really changed about that interface that at least I personally felt the, uh, the most. And then 
optimizing across interfaces, there are a few things that we learn when we try to solve some hard problems, and we start to see that you know, these interfaces really need to, to, to shift a little bit, and we can somehow educate more people who can optimize across these interfaces while preserving some nice properties about the software. And then finally, computer architecture as an academic discipline. You know, being in academia for a long time, there are a few things that I saw in computer architecture which could be controversial. Okay, so, uh, but I'll save it anyway because uh, you know what? Uh, hopefully, that will stimulate a little bit of discussion on the book, uh, Bo right. Okay. So, start with where we are today. Um, Illinois just launched the operation of Blue Water System, and it's, a, it's the biggest scientific computer system in the U.S. today in the, uh, for the National Science Foundation. There's, there are bigger systems that are not um, available in open uh, access. And um, it's operational since November last year, and now it's in full operation. It, uh, it's, it has a peak of 11.1 petaflops, and uh, it has 1.5 petabytes of DRAM, and uh, it consumes about 30 megawatt of uh, power. So, if you compare this system with the Titan system, which many of you are familiar with, the Titan system was the number one computer in the top 500 list last year. And you said, what did you just say? You said it's the Blue Waters is the biggest computer, uh, supercomputer in, for the science community in the U.S., which is true. If you compare the size of the machine, you will see that um, the, the machine actually has more nodes, okay, a lot more nodes than the uh, Titan computer. It has a lot more memory. There are several applications that can only run on Blue Waters today compared to the, uh, the versus the, uh, the Oak Ridge Titan computer. So this particular machine is now running running 36 different application uh, areas and um, uh, it's in full operation. And one of the reasons why we were not allowed to run the top 500 um, run is because that run is going to take almost a month of Blue Water's time. And NSF calculates 1.6 million dollars for operating the machine for that period, and they would not allow us to run that uh, run unless the Illinois state comes up with the money. And as you, many of you know, my pension is already in the in the drain, so uh, the state <laughs> definitely doesn't have that money. So we are, you know, <coughs> we're running these applications rather than uh, 500. And one of the interesting things that you can notice that uh, they're really a good balance of all these you know, scientific areas and also a very wide range of app, uh, data structures and um, algorithms that uh, need to run on this machine. So we are you know, actively doing, hopefully we can do weather prediction for tomorrow rather than for yesterday. You know, right now we can do weather prediction for yesterday extremely accurately on this, on this machine. And we, well, uh, we are hoping that uh, in a few months these people will begin to predict the weather accurately for tomorrow. Okay. So uh, you know, these these are all very nice you know science applications and um, you know what, we're very happy to, to be able to support all these things and um, you know for those of you who are familiar with all these other supercomputing centers there are many other machines and there are many other science teams that are doing similar things here so essentially what we're saying here is we're doing well okay we're building very large scale machines we're running some very you know what large science applications, so we can just build bigger and bigger machines, right? So the answer is not really. Blue Waters is running at about uh, 10 megawatt. In fact, it's running nominally at uh, almost 30 megawatt at this point, close to the economic limit for scientific computing. It's really almost at the edge of what a, the U.S. is willing to pay for scientific computing in this kind of machine. So the next machine really cannot have more than double of this power. You know, we're really already pushing the envelope. And the technology advancement alone is unlikely to produce big breakthroughs. If we look at the processors coming down the pipe, they're probably going to be processors 
that will give us maybe two times, you know what, uh, or so uh, overall performance in the next five years. But um, we're definitely not going to get the next big jump just by you know natural technology advancement. And even worse than that, when we see the when we build these bigger and bigger machines, we are doing mostly weak scaling. That is, we're running bigger and bigger problems. But we're not necessarily running these problems faster. Just to give you an example, if you talk to the molecular dynamics uh, simulation people, they will tell you that they are able to run bigger and bigger simulation experiments. But if you look at each experiment, it takes about one uh, day to run one microsecond worth of simulation um, you know, on any of these systems. And some of these systems run much, much smaller, uh, slower. So, but any meaningful um, reaction still takes at least milliseconds to happen in most of the uh, kind of systems they study. So we're talk still talking about thousands of times of difference in terms of what an interactive experiment could be versus a kind of a, you know, a grad student launching an application and then go to Samos for a vacation and then come back for a result. So there's still a very big gap for these kind of uh, studies. So why are these things so slow and what are these things you know, what, um, so power hungry and so on? There are many, many reasons, but uh, I'm going to show a couple ones that we, you know, we feel are very important and probably the primary part of them. Before we go into that, there's no way I can give this talk without showing this picture. And uh, for those of you who, you know, who have read the, 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 the textbook by uh, Sanjay Patel and Yale Pat, and this is the layers of abstraction that um, you know, well, we, we use to build our computing systems. And computer architecture, as we all you know, uh, talk about it, is really you know, somewhere around this, uh, this area where it provides this interface between programs and how we build hardware and so on. So that's kind of a still very much true. But if you look at the practice, if you start to look at how this really worked out in either scientific computing or commercial computing, things have shifted enough that um, you know, this picture starts to get a little bit ugly. So let's kind of take a look at uh, what we kind of see in, in the field. So this is a kind of a um, uh, data transfer diagram for a typical node in a supercomputer today. And um, um, when we build these computers, um, we will typically have a PCIe um, you know, interconnection that connects the CPU. And um, you know, in, in Blue Water's case, we have about 4,000 of those GPUs connected through the PCIe 2. And obviously, we already have PCIe 3 generation. And we have network I.O. and disk I.O. all uh, connected into the PCIe hub. So this is really the kind of the main interconnect and this bandwidth is about 6, 8, and hopefully going to about 16 gigabyte per second in the system. 16 gigabyte per second in the next generation is quite good, but not nearly as good as the DRAM bandwidth that we're getting out of the system. This is, this is about 50 gigabyte per second today, and this is about 250 gigabyte per second today. So we're talking about somewhere uh, somewhere one one uh, uh, one fifth to uh, one eighth to one fifth today going to one third in uh, compared to the uh, main memory bandwidth and definitely way way more uh, uh, far behind in terms of the GDDR the, uh, the graphics part of the bandwidth. So when data comes in from the network in MPI communication, uh, what we would like to to have in many applications is something like this. We want the API message to come directly into the device memory, and then we have the GPU to, to really crank on them and you know, what, essentially generate the next batch of results. And this is a, you know, essentially what the programmers would like to see for a lot of the uh, stencil type, you know, uh, PBE software type of computation, and a lot of these uh, molecular dynamics kind of computation. They would like to keep 
the, um, the, the uh, uh, non-local force and um, the bulk of the uh, partial differential equation uh, solver state in the uh, high, very high bandwidth memory and having a high throughput device to keep generating results and have the skill <coughs> to generate the difficult results which are the sort of the, uh, the, the, the more difficult part of the solver combine the two but the bulk of the bandwidth should be along this, uh, this line so this is kind of what the, the programmer would like to see or would like to believe that they will see in the system and this is kind of what the programmer really experienced in the system today the network I.O. is going to, uh, to be done with an, the MPI through several layers of protocol and it depends on which one you use you have more or fewer layers of protocol so you have the data transfer through DMA into the main memory and then depending on the number of protocol layers you will have these data copies in, uh, into your system and eventually you will uh, transfer the data out from the PCIe bus into the device memory depending on how you deal with the uh, interface between MPI and uh, CUDA or OpenCL that people use today you may have even more intermediate copies to deal with the pin memory requirements and so on so each one of these things essentially diminishes the application perceived bandwidth of your interconnect every additional copy essentially occupies more of the time slots of this interconnect so if you do the three edges essentially you can expect no more than one third of the PCIe bandwidth that the user actually perceives so when we look at the real applications today the kind of performance that we're getting is extremely limited <coughs> whenever we see this kind of picture and the interesting part is that the application interface is actually extremely uh, uh, fragile in this particular kind of environment. The older hardware and runtime requires explicit data API calls for each copy step. So you will actually see in the user code that the MPI, there's some kind of MPI message and then you have the explicit copy into a, uh, in, into a more uh, a CUDA type of buffer and then you see the uh, pin memory kind of uh, situation and then you, you, you send data out and newer hardware and runtime allows for fewer copies you know what um, NVIDIA has been adding more and more architecture features such as unified virtual uh, address space unified physical address space to allow these devices to talk to each other so there's some limited uh, I.O. network devices that can talk to the, uh, the device memory more directly so some of these newer generation can actually reduce the number of uh, copies but they require application rewrite that is you need to actually go into the application and rewrite your code in order to do this so you start to see applications and we see that we actually see that in these applications that they have all the if defines and they you know you, you they provide all these different execution paths depending on which type of hardware they're running and then they, they, uh, they will select the right path and they do all the uh, operations accordingly and this is not exactly the pretty computer architecture interface we would like them to see the software really shouldn't be seeing all these variations and then deal with directly these things there, for any good interface there should be a reasonably good abstraction to give people that interface turns out that Nacho and I have been working, you know, collaborating on this GMAC uh, you know, uh, uh, software which was published in S plus uh, 10 and the interface abstracts all these intermediate copies away but inserts the intermediate copies for all the hardware and runtime and when we tried to publish this paper in ISCA before S plus we got a review um, actually we got three reviews and all the three reviews says this is kind of a nice paper but it really shouldn't be published in ISCA because it doesn't pro propose new hardware mechanism it pro it's, it's proposing to, 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 for a new interface and it has new software implementation to use the underlying hardware in the, but there's no, no new hardware <coughs> mechanism in this paper so ISCA says no and then ASPLUS took it 
And so this is actually one of my highest reference papers today. And it's kind of interesting to see, you know what, I'll come back to this point, and I believe that many of you probably have experienced the same thing. That is, you know, oftentimes when we talk about interfaces and so on, it's a little bit hard to get the computer architecture program committees to, you know, to, um, to, to evaluate or uh, accept these papers. And I have been chairing these program committees for, for many years, including ISCA and so on. When I look at those comments, I'm not surprised. And in many ways, I'm not angry either. But um, I think there is some in important reconsideration we need to begin to think about to make our community relevant as far as the application developers are concerned. I think the way we're going, we are beginning to marginalize ourselves in terms of the, the biggest population of program uh, application programmers are concerned. Scientific computing is one, but um, in terms of that data transfers in big data and analytics are even worse. So this is a picture that uh, uh, I borrowed from uh, you know uh, from Ray Sun in uh, Audible Wear, and uh, this is a picture of the Hadoop. Uh, Matt produce a uh, Matt reduce uh, 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 software framework, and where things actually are really done uh, in that uh, framework. So, uh, if you're familiar with the Matt reduce framework, uh, the input is actually read from the local disks, and then you go through this Matt phase and uh, essentially partition your data into uh, into the uh, uh, parts that are more closely related to each other. And then you uh, you save it on disk, and then you move it to the uh, you know, what you do the, uh, the, the the sorting and whatever processing necessary, and then eventually um, you would uh, generate the final result through this re uh, reduction process. And there's some interesting uh, aspects about this uh, particular framework. One is it's the most popular MapReduce uh, framework that uh, most people. Uh, who are doing data analytics use today. It doesn't mean that they use the exact version that you can download in the system, but they have also their own enhancements. But um, this, is, this tend to be the, the most uh, you know, uh, popular framework for real use today. And the second one is this whole framework is developed in Java. So it's actually running on the Java virtual machine. This is not running on a real hardware metal layer. And whenever we have data that needs to be moved through the network, what's really happening is that the data is actually moving through the Java uh, native machine interface and into the system call. And then eventually it gets done. So whenever we need to do something like a compression, let's say, if you know what, um, the application says, my data is way too big. I want to do some compression. It's actually not trivial to be able to incorporate a compression mechanism um, other than what the framework does for you. So you need to plug in your the compression routine into the framework, and that's how the interface kind of works. So it turned out that when we, whenever people start to use network I/O cards with compression engine, what happens with that framework? is that the data will come in through the network card and into DMA into the main memory. And then you will do some kind of copying you know what, so that you can get the data into the Java virtual machine um, memory management, uh, sort of the, uh, the garbage collectible data structure. And you will uh, do some, you know, if you need to do compression, there, there will be some you know what, additional copying to, you know, to make the data uh, amenable to the uh, compression uh, codec interface. And eventually, if you have a hardware compression engine, that data will be sent out from the PCIe bus back into the I.O. processor for processing. So whenever you have a hardware compression engine, theoretically what you would love to do is to be able to take the data, right? And as the data come in, you want to be able to decompress right there. Right, and then send it to the, uh, to the uh, processor for, for processing. But the software interface has been done in such a way that 
the most natural way of doing the processing becomes this way. And obviously, you're not going to get much benefit out of these accelerators or engines through all these copies. And people invariably try to deal with this. A lot of the companies actually try to insert their uh, uh, compression engine support and so on by breaking the Java interface, by changing the Hadoop, the way the Hadoop could work, by combining the I.O. aspect, the network aspect with the compression aspect in a somewhat, you know, uh, somewhat software, you know, what I would say, you change the, uh, you change the, the software and try to push it back to the main trunk. It doesn't always work. So these things always cause a lot of problem for um, these kind of, you know, big software frameworks and so on today. And eventually the compressed data will come back to the main memory for, for the processing. So what I'm trying to do is say is this. We have been looking at computer architecture as the interface. And we have been working on things like, well, uh, sequential instructions, and then we implement them in parallel, as parallel instructions. And today, we really need to begin to, you know, to look at more of the software inter interface from a higher level. We still have work to do in the kind of you know, interface, the, uh, the aspects that we used to look, to look at. But I argue that we drastically underestimated the importance of these other system level architecture uh, interfaces that um, you know, more and more of the application developers are developing. And if we don't inject more rational way of dealing with these interfaces, defining the interfaces, implementing these interfaces, things will just deteriorate even more in, in the future. And that will cost us because many of the, the progress, the application development are slowed down because of these poor interfaces. And as an industry, we will see more slowdown and uh, less progress in the future because of this kind of behavior. Some people say that um, you, know, you need to have very different programming interface for CPUs and GPUs. And um, you know what, we have developed a program interface for OpenCL called the MXPA that can generate much better code than um, OpenMP code can generate, uh, compilers can generate for the multi-core uh, processors. Sometimes you can even get four times, six times better performance by just generating um, CPU, multi-core CPU code based on the OpenCL. So we can go into these kind of things again and again, but there's one important message I'm trying to make. We have not really invested enough in the higher level programming language interface to our hardware. We have been having very fragmented ways for application developers to develop their software. So the question is, do we want to continue to operate at the lower level, or do we need, to, uh, or do we want to take back that interface and recognize the fact that we need to define the higher level programming interfaces as a community for the application developers? So, here is a kind of an interesting um, experience I learned um, when we try to solve some hard problems in uh, GPU programming. So. Uh, there was a kind of a, a library, important library uh, function called, uh, uh, essentially it's a, a tri-diagonal solver library. And this library is used by a lot of the preconditioners pre and, um, uh, and even a spline interpolation kind of uh, you know, routines in um, you know, financial analysis and so on. And NVIDIA was having a lot of trouble with the numerical stability of that library. So, you know what, we, we kind of you know what, uh, look at the, the problem and we started to realize that um, the algorithms that they used were too simple-minded and the algorithms that they used did not use any pivoting at all in solving the, uh, the linear system equations. So, it's eventually we agreed um, you know, that um, a better algorithm is going to be the, uh, the spike-based algorithm that can actually do pivoting. And I'm not going to spend the time, the 45 minutes, talking about the, the intricacies of this. But I wanted to, to point out a few interesting things. So uh, if you look at the NVIDIA library code versus the uh, Intel MKL library code, 
the, uh, the runtime is actually you know, quite good. It runs at about uh, one, uh, eight times faster on the media GPU compared to the, uh, the sequential CPU. And um, the MKL library is sequential, by the way. It's not multi-threaded. So, um, so there's no option to run the MKL library in the uh, multi-threaded mode. So this is actually a fair comparison. However, if you look at the numerical error of the CU sparse implementation compared to Intel, we're talking we are oftentimes two orders of magnitude, even you know, even six orders of magnitude more and even more error in many of these you know, uh, matrices. The reason is whenever you have very small values in the diagonal, you start to trigger numerical stability problems. It's a well-known problem, and uh, everyone complains about it. So eventually, we uh, we, we did uh, an implementation in my group to actually uh, use the spike algorithm. It turns out that the spike algorithm is also used in the Intel next generation for the Intel multi-core CPUs because that's also necessary for Intel to be able to use multi-threading and, and uh, you know, uh, vector more effectively. So one thing that uh, was kind of uh, interesting is using that more sophisticated algorithm, we actually had to do a transposition of data on the GPU and Yale is going to, to cringe because uh, he has seen the data, uh, we have been talking about the transposition uh, data conversion for you know, what, uh, many times. And um, so, you know what, if you look at the, um, the kind of matrices, the zero diagonal matrices and the, the, the diagonally uh, dominant matrices, if you do the, the data transposition, you get about uh, four times faster um, on the GPUs. But then for random, it doesn't really help you. It turns out that you also, uh, it's because of the DRAM access behavior. So we need to do what we call a dynamic tiling. Essentially, I'll translate that into a simple language. You put a barrier synchronization every so many iter iterations in your code, and you're done. So this gives you 3.5 times for the random distribution. With these two relatively simple optimization, one quick transpose, one uh, you know what, uh, one uh, uh, access timing for DRAM burst control, you actually have a new solver that has comparable uh, runtime for hard matrices and even faster runtime for simpler matrices, and for numerical error, it's comparable to the MKL. So this one is not in the um, in, in the commercial release of CU sparse. It replaced the whole algorithm. But one thing that that keeps coming back is that these two optimizations were not obvious to any of the algorithm designers at all. They never really quite understood how we did it. They always thought it's magic. And the reason that we did we knew these two is because we know exactly what's going on in the hardware. And we figure out that there are two buttons that you have to push to get the performance back up. Otherwise, this new implementation is actually going to be essentially four times or more slower than the original one. Okay. So, let me say a few things. So that's the technical part. So maybe let me just you know, say a few uh, quick things about computer architecture as an academic discipline. You know what, um, if you don't disagree with these, you know what, uh, let's have a bigger discussion on the low right, right? So one is, if you look at the top most cited computer scientists according to different, you know what, uh, I would say different um, um, uh, databases, right? So you can do, go size here, you can go to Microsoft, you can do Google, Scholar. Very few computer architects are among the top 20 most cited computer, sci uh, com computer scientists. And it's something to think about. You know, it, it, I really encourage you to go and then look at the uh, people who have this high citation. Yes, they probably have more papers than us, but if you look at the number of citations per paper, they're also much, much higher. And this is actually causing us problem as a discipline in terms of many Seem, you know, when we get to senior stages and so on, this actually caused some very subtle problems for us as a discipline. The second one is, if you look at the citation index for the ISCA papers, this is what people call the impact 
uh, you know, uh, the kind of the impact index. And um, you know what? We are not categorized as the high index publication. Then. Our papers tend to have fairly modest number of citations. We can argue all day long why that's the case, why it may or may not matter, and so on. In fact, you know what? I'm hoping that we'll have a little bit of discussion right here. But the truth of the matter is, even though we believe conferences like ISCA, Micro, are very high quality, competitive, you know, very you know, what, selective, prestigious conferences, when I serve on the promotions committee at the campus level, people invariably come back with these kind of things. They would come back with these numbers and say, what did you say again? So, you know what, I have to go redo all the suns and dance and I confuse them enough that they will eventually let them place cases too, right? But um, you know, every time it's a sun and dance, okay? And you know, it, 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 it's something that we should think about. And we will, I would uh, like to, you know what, uh, you know what, uh, oops. Also, uh, to say, you know, few top institutions today consider computer architecture as a high priority hiring area. This year, in my own institution, I look around and said, you know, here's some very strong computer architect, right? And you know what, let's interview them. And people say, well, maybe, you know what, since you're, you know what, you're, 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 you're here, you know what, you're kind of a useful guy, so you know, we'll let you interview them. But we'll hire them only if we cannot hire in these other areas. And that doesn't help me. Okay, then, you know, it feels very, very bad in these meetings. You know, what the, and the sense that I, I have in these meetings is that fundamentally people do not believe that computer architecture is going to be the most influential, the most exciting, the most career building kind of place for young people in the future. They rather invest in some of these other things. And as a community, we have to change that. And we really cannot let that continue. At least, if you think that everywhere else is different, help me to correct the situation in my, my own institution. That would be, it's the, that, even that alone would make this trip worthwhile. Right? And finally, few venture capitalists consider computer architecture as a major source of next big startups. When I talk to people in the Silicon Valley and so on, 20 years ago, there are many, many people who would want to put money into computer architecture related kind of startups. Today, almost no. And it may or may not be important from each of our career um, you know, perspective, but I do think as a discipline, we need to have some good outlet of startups and big successes, commercial successes in the future so that we can continue to be a vibrant field. We can continue to attract the best of the grad, new grad students in our field. Finally, some potential actions. Um, one is, you know, I would really like to, to, to encourage our community to take charge of the major application programming interfaces. Not many of you are uh, involved in OpenCL standards committee. You know what, I serve on the committee, but I feel very lonely. You know, what the, uh, I, it has been very hard to push some of the more rational things through the interfaces. But as a community, we need to begin to, you know, to be more active, rather than having the industry to, to continue to just push their little, little things through the, uh, the standard, trying to screw the other competitors and trying to make things more difficult for, you know, for some other cases. There's got to be a longer term, more rational, We need to teach programmers what they need to know about computer architecture. We currently don't teach enough computer architecture concepts that the programmers really need to know in order to, to write good quality code. We, teach, we often teach these courses to people who are supposed to become designers. But we don't teach to people who will really need to understand these concepts in order to write good quality code. And the third, the final one is, uh, like to 
you know, but the, uh, the next one is encourage computer architects, uh, architecture students to understand more about applications and numerical methods. Most of my students don't understand numerical methods. When we wrote that paper, it was like pulling teeth. I actually need to learn a lot more about numerical methods, and I still make a whole lot of mistakes through the process. And I feel that even with a numerical analysis course from Belvo Cajon at Berkeley, I was still underprepared in understanding the sub some of the very important subtleties of these algorithms and which ones are really the more important ones for us to, you know, to get performance improvement. And rethink, finally, rethink the scope of computer architecture conferences. Do we really want to continue to have our own current trajectory? Or as an academic venue, do we want to make these conferences more relevant for the future of application software? And I believe it's time for us to make our conferences much more relevant to the population of software developers in the future. So a lot of these things are learned from many, many people. And then I listed a few of them uh, that I talk to frequently and so on. But there's so many others who have, you know, what, um, what, have, you know, what taught me so many things that, um, you know, what, that led to some of the things. So, you know, if some of these things don't sound right to you, it's all my fault. But if some of these things sound about right to you, then uh, it credit goes to um, all these people. So even though I said a few things that uh, may concern young people, I still want to end with, you know, what an important quote to me. Um, you know, for those of you who enjoyed the, uh, you know, uh, the world of Ruiz, uh, you know, Aragorn in the eve of the battle of the uh, Pangon in uh, Minas Tirith, there's always hope. Okay, so uh, I really think that this is an incredibly strong community and we will be able to evolve, we'll be able to even revolutionize in the way we need in order to stay as one of the most important research communities in the world. Thank you. So, Carlo, how much time do we have for Ten questions? Minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes for questions. Uh, so, by the way, uh, before I do questions, um, your last couple of slides provided lots of opportunity for far more than ten minutes. There will be a panel at the end of tomorrow's sessions, and I hope you're going to bring, in fact, let's fix it so that we can project on the screen at the panel tomorrow those slides because there's an enormous amount of dialogue that we might profitably have. But for the nine and a half minutes that are still left for questions, uh, who has a question? I think you might need to ask the first one. Boy, there's so many first questions <coughs> you can ask. You know, reminded of the two. Ah, uh, good. There's a question. <laughs> no, no. You don't want to hear the remind us. <laughs> you don't want to hear my. Uh, oh, so we'll my hear the later, you know. Huh? Uh, look, indeed, uh, this was uh, exactly the first time I had. The, the, the last couple of slides is a long discussion, and it's even a better idea. I was planning to talk to you about that on the board, but on the panel, it's even a better opportunity for you. As usual, you are master. Now, on the first part. Look, I agree, obviously, that uh, whatever architectural extension is too expensive to build in the hardware, we should build the on-time software for. And obviously, many people disagree that this is uh, part of the computer architecture. This is obviously part of the computer system architecture, but not in the computer architecture or microarchitecture, yeah. as, uh, as you correctly indicated, what this uh, uh, consider. And this is a big problem, and indeed uh, we have to do our best to change it. So that one we agree. And you also show a couple of examples of the data locality, how data locality can hurt the performance in this example we have. But do you think that data locality we should be solving only in the low level software, or there are still some opportunities in the microarchitecture that can be done? Yes. Uh, will be your yeah. The answer is definitely there. There's still a lot of opportunities in the microarchitecture to uh, to keep that software locality, because um, that's essentially what um, GMAC was doing. So let's say if you have a data that needs to be compressed, so instead of 
sending the data to the CPU and then send it back, GMAC it allows the, uh, the software to just set pointers. So, and then it maintains coherence. So if the CPU ended up really want that data, want to look at the data before decompression, then the copy is made, right? And if you have better microarchitecture support for the memory management, for the, you know, for the address translation, you know, definitely. We definitely have, you know, a lot more opportunities in that kind of area. But it's kind of interesting. Um, you know, uh, again, I'm, I'm among friends, you know, I'm being recorded. So if you talk to companies, a lot of the companies don't want to see this kind of microarchitecture work succeed. Because a lot of these things it means that the data will be able to freely, the, the processing will be able to freely move around, and the data can be kept in some places where, and the CPU may never see it. So, you know what, there is a real sense of, you know, I would say potential uh, diminishing importance of certain way of doing computing. So we're actually at an era where, you know what, um, the academics really need to begin to take charge and say, we understand your concerns, we understand your revenue, you know, we understand you want to hold on to your market, but as a, you know, as a humankind, we need to make progress. Thank you. Questions? I was a little disappointed in this Java interface. <laughs> Rightfully so. Once you start with Java, probably you've lost the ball game altogether. I'm reminded of the two mathematicians who were sitting there and they asked the first guy, you see that uh, pail of water on the floor? Boil it. So what did he do? Took the pail of water off the floor, put it on the stove with the fire. Sure enough, he boiled it. Then they turned to the second mathematician and said, see that pail of water? On the table, boil it. What do you think the second mathematician did? He said, just put the, do put the pail of water, the water on the floor. Exactly. Apparently, that was lost on this audience. Yeah. 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 Too much abstraction. Is that it? You had a data slide. Yeah. And uh, it looked like what you were doing was good. You want to bring up that data slide? Which one? Uh, the one that has a number of benchmarks, <laughs> and it's for each benchmark there is one bar. Oh, I see what you're saying. Maybe this one. Uh, <coughs> oh, the interface. Okay, I, I see what you're saying. Here. Right. And you see what you didn't do, which you never did in your presentation. No, 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 no. So you do real well, right? Yeah. In fact, that uh, that one over there has a performance benefit of what? Uh, 90, 90, 90 times, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah. So what's wrong with the benchmark that gives you a big lose? Well, this is because the, um, the, the OpenCL um, the model does not fit for this particular way. But if you write it the right way, this is a bad OpenCL code anyway. But uh, it's provided by other people. So there's no insight to be, to be explained it's just to the audience? Yeah, if you write the, the code correctly, it will be better. Oh, okay. so it's not a good deal. But bad code is reality. We, uh, I see back all the time. I understand, but when I saw the, the set of bars, and you didn't tell me why you did so much worse on that bar, I felt the need to, to bring it up. Yeah, it runs terribly on the GPU too. Okay, any? Uh, go ahead. Well, the uh, the blue water system in Illinois. You said it's a consumes a, how much of power? One megawatt? Ten megawatt? It? Thirty so megawatt. People back there can't hear you. You have to speak up when you ask a question. Oh, so Thirty that. megawatt. The, how does the power breaks down? Does it include the cooling, the uh, entire cooling, cooling system consumption? Also? Yes. Yeah. It includes all the cooling. How about the each processor? How much? Power? Is it, it has thousands of processors. Or, can you show me the yeah, slide? Yeah. You, you can kind of divide it. Um, uh, there are twenty-five thousand nodes. And each node has two sockets. 
So you can kind of divide it because the, it, it is the vast majority of the power anyway. What kind of processor does it use? Like it's a, a Interlagos, AMD Interlagos CPU and the NVIDIA Kepler GPU, K110. Is it CMOS or? CMOS. CMOS. How about the memories? Memory is also CMOS or is it bipolar? Or is no, it's a CMOS. It's actually CMOS. CMOS. Yeah. And it consumes that much power? Yeah. I think, go ahead. Yeah, it's just a, a observation, um, and I think it would vary. I think the, the question I want to ask you is, is the funding need for requirements in the US matching what you think needs to be done in computer architecture? But before you answer the question, I, I sort of want to make a comment from a UK perspective, in that if you look at microelectronics in terms of the challenges that face microelectronics, we've made a conscious decision in the UK actually reduce the funding of microelectronics because they argue that for um, aspects to do with conventional CMOS, they'll say that that's been done in companies. I think to some argument there may be a situation to say that some of the research that you're talking about, computer architectures, has now gone from academia and is better done within companies. Yes. And is that, is that really reflected in US funding? Now, I think on the EU level, there seems to be a sort of surge in terms of embedded systems, which is good. But it would it seemed to be that governments tend to make decisions based on financial aspects. Yeah. Which I think long term for the UK will be problematic because the microelectronics research activity is just dying. It, it's the same thing in the US. Is the government actually doing more or less or just staying the same? Yeah, the, the government has been doing less. Um, the, the US funding pattern has been more on the uh, interdisciplinary sort of big problem solving. If you look at the NSF funding, the, the, the bulk of the funding goes to, to interdisciplinary big kind of uh, problem solving, right? So computer architects get funding through that, right? And you know, I get funds, funding through some of the NSF programs and some of the DOE programs, some of the, uh, the DARPA programs because of the big problem solving kind of things. I don't get a lot of money only for this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what I do in my spare time uh, as far as the U US government is concerned. Having said all that, DARPA just came back and started to fund more of the computer architecture research because they started to realize that, that there is a big gap of power uh, requirement versus uh, you know what the trajectory is going to look like for industry. So the DARPA perfect program by, managed by Bob Colwell has put, you know, I would say a few tens of million dollars into the into the research for you know to to speed that up. But all the research that I'm aware of are done essentially without really worrying about the software interfaces. So all that work assumes that someone is going to just mess with the software so that they can get access to the kind of you know quirky hardware that we would, we're, we're building. And I can say that because I'm building some of that quirky hardware, right? But um, there's really no concern about maintaining the kind of the, uh, the productive software interface when we try to use that kind of hardware. So I feel compelled to add right now, but this is a absolutely perfect uh, uh, vehicle for, for tomorrow's panel. Uh, the uh, the federal government, the U.S., is so overwhelmingly pro interdisciplinary uh, research at the expense of the core disciplines that it's gotten just ridiculous. Colwell is a is an architect of uh, great stature. He was the chief architect of the Penny and Pro chip, for example, at Intel before he went on to reinventing himself. So he is very pro computer architecture. But the uh, the thrust in the U.S. is that the the core disciplines don't matter anywhere as near as much as inter interdisciplinary. So you know, biomathematics, you start with a lousy biologist and a worse mathematician. Somehow if they get together, they'll do good work in biomathematics, which of course doesn't happen. Uh, the other thing which has historically been true in computer architecture is exactly what you've seen in microelectronics in the UK, apparently. I didn't know about it in the UK. I do know about it in the US, and that is the uh, as you point out, industry is going to have to worry about this problem. We can spend our federal funds on something else. 
The problem is that industry is going to spend its money not on stuff eight to ten years out, they're going to spend this money on stuff they need for their next product to make money, as Professor Hu pointed out. So the net effect is the federal government doesn't want to fund it because they say industry will. Industry doesn't want to fund it because it's not going to show any near-term profits. And so the amount of funding goes down. But this is, as I said, this is something that for further discussion. And tomorrow. then your academics and your uh, institutions, your vice chancellors, your principals and colleges look at that and say that's an area that we don't want to be appointment in and we're in some representations to what we see. The hiring priorities and so on. Absolutely. I saw another question here. Right. Uh, so I was looking at the diagram you showed, you showed uh, for the bandwidth being uh, sent to the CPU. And like, uh, uh, so that's the bottleneck when you have to get some work done by the GPU. Uh, so there is like, uh, I mean, so this is a real problem, uh, as you said, and like there is there, there is some work, uh, there, there is some noise about like PIMS and stuff like that in order to like, you know, handle this. So I feel like over, there are certain, there are many problems, and I see like a trend on them. Like first of all, uh, there is like, especially the, the cross-disciplinary like uh, research, uh, research is like, okay, there is this interface like which is blocking something. Uh, so let's come up with some hack uh, across the layers, and then while a more methodical and structured solution comes along the way. Yeah. And this is what we're having even for the problem that we're talking about. Yes. So don't you think this is the more natural progression of research rather than like, you know, every time, you know, being, fixing yourself to interface? Yes, so yeah, absolutely. Um, you know what, um, maybe I'm saying things I shouldn't say here. Um, I honestly think that we're giving our students too much pressure in terms of publications. So. I'm seeing more and more um, strong graduate students, okay, well, I'm talking about very bright graduate students, who don't want to do the sort of the, the more real way of fixing these kind of problems. That they much rather do these smaller things so that each one could be a publication. And as a you know what I think as a community our grad students probably have more pressure to publish than when I was a grad student. You know, what, uh, I still remember when I was working in Yale's group, you know, we're trying to figure out how to get out of all the uh, execution to work. And honestly, you know what, spent two years making all kinds of mistakes and you know, figuring out that, uh, why things don't work. In the end, really helped. Right, that it, it takes a long, long time, as you said. Rather than tweaking one thing and then you know another thing, you know sometimes you really need to build, you know, just kind of figure things out, build a system, test it, and then uh, say, oh, you know what? Uh, now I understand the problem more, and eventually publish, you know, a really strong paper rather than trying to do these little fixes. I, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm right. answering your question. So, so what's the solution for that? Like, you know, yeah. I, I agree. That's, that's right. I can see the uh, chairman getting up here. Yeah. So. But they know, part uh, of the panel tomorrow. You know, I'd like to know what people think. You know, what, I'm, I'm telling you what I think. <laughs> How many papers had I published when I got my PhD? Want to make a guess? How many papers had I published when I got my PhD? Andre says two. I guess. That's your guess. Wrong. Zero? Zero. That's right. Because it was all about trying to come up with something that mattered rather than the next least publishable unit of nonsense. Yeah. Professor Hu is absolutely right on target. Okay, so we have exhausted our 10 minutes and then some. And so uh, we got a boat trip and we've got a panel tomorrow. We've got a whole day tomorrow and a panel tomorrow and then a brilliant keynote tomorrow and another brilliant keynote on Wednesday. Thank you.